How we doing? So I'm here setting up recording our um, next video. So um, if you're following along with the lecture notes that I've posted online, um, you notice that I haven't lectured on Raman spectroscopy yet. I'm going to skip that for now. Um, and if we have time, I may come back to that. Um, but I'm not going to hold you responsible for that. There is a ton of information out there about Raman spectroscopy. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a Raman spectrometer at HSU, so you don't really get much experience with it anyways. Um, but now what I'm doing, I'm working through here. You can see I've got my week 14 slides up. I'm starting on slide number four. Um, and this talk, which is the only um, lecture talk that I'm going to record for this week, this is the only thing you need to worry about this week, um, this is purely going to be on uh, methods, so methodologies in um, spectroscopy. I'm mostly going to focus on FTIR because it's what I do, but also because FTIR is so common, you, you've done it so much, um, especially in OCHEM, that I think it's really nice to talk about it in depth. Okay, so the first things that I want to talk about are um, a few of our basics with Beer's Law. So we have uh, optical depth, transmittance, and absorbance. So transmittance and absorbance you're probably familiar with. Optical depth you probably aren't so familiar with. But as you can tell from these equations, um, optical depth and absorbance are very closely related. Okay. So if you imagine you have um, a sample here in some type of cuvette with some type of known length, uh, typically those are 1.0 centimeters, right? And we shine some uh, radiation on that sample with intensity I naught, and the molecule absorbs some of that radiation, and then there's less intensity coming through. And so really the, the best definition of that is the optical depth. So there is a natural log decay of light intensity through the sample. It's not an LOG log, it is a natural log decay. And that makes good sense when you compare this to our tunneling problem. This looks very similar to the tunneling problem, right? These are going to be, um, this is going to be a wave with some wavelength. And there's going to be an exponentially decaying signal in the sample. And then the light comes back out um, with some reduced intensity. Okay. So that's um, how we describe optical depth. It's the natural log of the ratio of I naught um, over I. Okay, and so uh, transmittance is then just the ratio of I over I naught, all right? And notice the ratios are flipped, okay? Um, so, for example, if you have a 100% transmittance sample, that means no absorption has happened. And if you have a 0% transmittance sample, that means all of the light was uh, blocked and couldn't make it through. Um, okay, and so... Our relationship between transmittance and optical depth is e to the negative tau. Um, so there's that exponentially decaying signal of light through the sample. Um, we commonly use absorbance in chemistry, which is the same as optical depth, except for it's LOG, uh, so base 10 log. And it still is I0 over I. Okay. And so we know that uh, absorbance and transmittance are related by A equals negative log of T. And then now finally we can relate absorbance and transmittance by, or excuse me, absorbance and optical depth by this ratio natural log of 10. So that's the natural log of the base of the various logs, right? So that means A equals tau, and then the natural log of 10 is 2.303. Um, so if you take 2.303 times the absorbance, that gives you the optical depth, all right? And so now in comparing the Beer-Lambert law, and, and we talked about some of this, if you recall, I think back in um, maybe even 361. Um, so this is the form of Beer's law that you're used to seeing, the base 10 form, okay? Where it says absorbance equals uh, molar absorptivity, right? Um, concentration in molarity and path length in centimeters. So we recognize that's mole per liter. And because absorbance is unitless, um, so that means this has to be liter per mole centimeter 
or uh, one over molarity, one over centimeter. So that's molar absorptivity. Okay. So in the um, base E beer Lambert law, okay, where it's optical depth equals sigma times n times L, well, L is still our path length in centimeters. N is our concentration in molecules per cubic centimeter. And then sigma, we've talked about this before, um, but this is our cross section. Sometimes it's called the absorption cross section. Sometimes it's just simply the cross section. And if we think about our units here, this has to be square centimeter per molecule to give that optical depth a unitless dimension. And this kind of makes sense when you think about it. Um, it it's actually has units of a cross section of a cross sectional area, square centimeter per molecule. So we imagine if we're shining some light at a sample and it's got a relatively large cross section, right? Um, then not a whole lot of that light is going to make it through. Um, but if it has a very small cross section, then a lot of that light can just keep on penetrating through. So this is really the more physically accurate version of the Beer-Lambert law, considering that with cross section. And then of course we note if we want to compare sigma to epsilon, we've got to take in consideration this factor of 2.303. Okay, so we could substitute. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'll go ahead and erase these things so I can clear up some space. So we know that it's got to be 2.303 times epsilon concentration path length, which equals sigma number of molecules path length. So the path length and the path length will cancel. And if you convert your, um, either way, right, if you convert your number of molecules to mole per liter, or you convert your concentration into cubic centimeter per molecule, then you've got that Avogadro's number, right, to consider. Um, but the main thing to note is it'll be 2.303 times epsilon equals sigma and considering whatever unit analysis um, that you did to relate those two quantities. Okay. So moving on. So this is all good review from your physics prereqs. Um, so uh, reflection. And um, so here there's the classic law of reflection, right? That's uh, what you see in a mirror, right? The wave comes in the angle of incidence. That's what that I means. The angle of incidence um, has to match the angle of uh, reflection, okay? And that's if it's a perfectly atomically smooth surface. And even a mirror or like some really highly polished glass is never going to be uh, atomically smooth. It gets close and often our eyeballs are not um, sensitive enough to see if that angle of incidence and reflection are the same, they might be just ever so off if it's not an atomically smooth layer, but uh, we just don't have sensitive enough eyeballs to tell that, okay? And so that's what we call specular reflection when we get this angle of incidence matches the angle of reflection. But now when we have a more realistic surface where there are um, kinks and step edges and terraces and defects, right? Then based on the law of reflection, which states the angle of incidence um, matches the angle of reflection based on some normal line, right? So now if I'm coming in at this angle right here, well, there's my normal line to that angle, right? And so my incidence and reflection is going to look like that. Or over here, okay, sorry, so if I come in at that uh, angle of incidence, then my normal line to that surface might look like that, okay? And then now I'm going to have a different um, uh, angle. So that's what we call diffuse reflection. Um, and here, this picture that I've got, um, I, I actually think photographers are really good uh, photophysicists. They just never knew it. So here, this is where the, um, this water is nice and calm. It's not atomically smooth, but it's very close. Sure, why not? It's like a mirror, right? And so you can see the reflection 
um, you can see the specular reflection really, really well. Um, but as you know, as it maybe gets later into the day and it gets windy and the water gets choppy, you're not going to be able to see that mirror reflection anymore. The light is going to be scattered diffusely, um, which doesn't give you that nice specular image. Okay, So this is important to recognize, diffuse reflectance and specular reflectance. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time with this. I'm not going to make you do any kind of calculations with um, refraction, but hopefully you do remember Snell's law, um, which states that um, the, uh, the direction of a wave is going to change based on the medium that it's traveling through. And that's based on the um, incidence of refraction for that medium. Okay. So, um, right, if you've ever looked into a fish tank or into a clear glass of water, um, you'll notice that the image appears distorted, and that's due to this um, refraction. So a couple things to note that maybe you haven't talked about is critical angle and total internal reflection. So critical angle is when that angle of incidence is uh, such that the reflected ray won't make it out of the medium. So that creates some really cool optical illusions. Um, and if I, you know, was thinking more, I would have set up a couple of these cool optical illusions for you. But um, you can imagine there's cases, right, where, where you've got like a glass of water and you move it in front of an image and the image then disappears temporarily at a certain angle. So when you see the image disappearing, you've, met, you've reached that uh, critical angle. So this would be fun to try. Take a glass of water and um, put an object behind it and, and, you know, like my pen right here, okay? And then move that glass of water in front of the object and see if you can find the critical angle. And then there's total internal reflection. And that's when the angle of incidence um, is such that it gives you this, uh, I'll call it a reverse specular reflection, right? So theta one matches theta two. Um, and so you would have a wave that continues to bounce through the medium. This total internal reflection, um, this is really important for spectroscopy, and you've already used um, a form of spectroscopy in organic chemistry that uses total internal reflection, and I'll talk about that soon. Um, okay, so again, diffraction, uh, just some review from your physics class. Change the directions of waves when they pass through a small opening or around a barrier in their path, okay? So um, when the path is larger, um, there is less diffraction, right? Because the waves uh, don't have to, uh, they're not having to diffract through that smaller opening. So when you have a smaller opening, you've got a much larger angle of diffraction, okay? And then, um, so this leads me to specifically diffraction gradient. So um, those of you that took instrumental analysis or taking an instrumental analysis, I think you've, you've spent quite a bit of time talking about this. Um, if you haven't, this is why I want to talk about this now. Um, so in a diffraction grating, an incident beam of typically white light, so it's got all the wavelengths, um, can be uh, diffracted in a way that gives you a separation of wavelengths. So here on this diagram, you can see I've got the specular reflection, okay? So here is the incident beam and the reflected beam. And so if this was white light, and let's say um, I'll draw uh, this thing. So here's my grating, and here's my incident angle. There's my normal line, and here is my uh, reflected angle. If I put a detector right here, which I often like to draw like a little sideways eyeball as a detector. If this is white light coming in and our detectors was right there, we would see white light coming out. Okay. However, if I could move my detector to, uh, let's say, this angle right here, um, then you can see based on that picture, this detector would actually pick up um, a blue line, so that had been diffracted from that white light source. And if you kept moving 
your detector, uh, let's see, I don't have red, but I got purple, um, you would see a series based on the electromagnetic spectrum. So you would see at um, larger, uh, how can we say this? Yes, so at larger angles of reflection, more blue light, and as the angle of reflection decreases and even goes negative, you would see that go into smaller wavelengths, okay? So then now, and so the reason why this is, is these diffraction gratings, they actually have teeth that you can see right here based on that picture, right? That's not a smooth surface. They actually have these very regularly uh, spaced teeth, okay, or gratings. And so when an incident wavelength comes in, it can only be... Uh, diffracted at an angle that gives it a whole integer wavelength, all right? And so the way this works, I think I have a better slide uh, that I probably should have used, but um, let's see if I'm gonna zoom way in on this thing, okay? And so um, what's really happening right there, when this gets reflected, so let's see here, there's a reflection there and then there's a certain length of that line that I'll highlight right there and that's given by D sine of beta okay so right there sine of beta um, and then D is the distance between uh, gratings so this is just showing you like from that beam to that beam but really D is like your grading distance okay it's from like tooth to tooth or peak to peak or however you want to think about it, okay? So this blue line right here, that's sine of beta, and you can see the beta angle marked right there. And then now, let's see here, we have another incident wave front that's going to hit the other tooth, okay? And of course, there's a lot of these wave fronts, um, but if we think of the wave front that's exactly one tooth distance from the other wave front, Okay, that makes the um, distance D sine alpha given right there. All right. And so the way the grading equation works, because you have to have, um, so only whole integer wavelengths can be reflected, M times lambda, where M is any integer, any whole number integer, it's got to be equal to D times sine of alpha plus minus sine of beta. And so, um, or conversely, right, uh, we could say, uh, oh, excuse me, d sine alpha minus d sine beta equals lambda, okay? So you can only get whole integer wavelengths out of this thing. And that's why certain angles give you certain wavelengths, all right? And so if you're just shining white light across this whole thing, um, you can either move your detector and see different wavelengths, or as is typical, that grating will pitch or yaw. So it'll rotate in and out of the plane of the detector so that you can see, you know, for example, if I keep letting this thing pitch, I'll keep letting it pitch until all of a sudden now the blue wavelength is making it and it can keep pitching until the red wavelength makes it to the eyeballs, okay? So the way these diffraction gratings work, even though they're gonna give us um, all of those diffracted wavelengths simultaneously at different wavelengths, we can only see them based on the angle. So you have to either move the grating or you have to move your detector so that you can see those different wavelengths, okay? And the resolving power of this diffraction grating so it's um, what we call it spectral resolution is lambda. So pick any lambda wavelength and divide it by the difference between the next successive wavelength that you can resolve. And that gives you your resolution. OK, so um, if we were in the classroom, I would have I would be showing you my super cool, fancy little um, uh, ocean optics, those tiny little UV vis detectors that I brought into the, the very first day of the semester. And believe it or not, those have 
the little tiny box it's about that big and and also for those of you in bi biochem you probably remember my computer just froze up okay i think we're okay so you remember using those little spectra viz right where you put the cubettes so that's really impressive they have a tiny little grating in there and so what you have to consider for visible wavelengths these gratings are really really small they have to be because the wavelengths of light are small okay and so now this is where i'm going to describe our main difference um, and just the main two types of spectrometer spectrometers the fourier transform spectrometer and the dispersion spectrometer okay so everything that i've just been talking about with diffraction gratings is related to dispersion spectroscopy so this is the measurement of the absorption of light of a single or narrow range of wavelengths one at a time so wavelengths are scanned one at a time typically using a diffraction grating and so this is almost always uv vis um, based on uh, the size of the grating um, and the angles that you can achieve okay so um so consider that in uv vis even though you might see that like you get your whole spectrum like in one minute or less it's only measuring a single wavelength at a time so that's pretty impressive when you think about it when you're sitting there at the uv vis and you push go and you see it scanning the uv vis spectrometer it's literally pitching that grating you know in and out of the detector over that very very short period of time um that's i'll contrast that to fourier transform spectroscopy which is the simultaneous measurement of the absorption of light of many wavelengths at very high spectral re resolution okay so we're going to talk about fourier transform spectroscopy next um, so you are all very familiar with the Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, FTIR, but also um, NMR is a Fourier transform technique. Um, we didn't talk about Raman, but Raman is um, a Fourier transform technique. So the main difference, why you would want one versus the other, because Fourier transform has very high spectral resolution. So in other words, that delta lambda on Fourier transform is tiny it's really 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 tiny so that means Fourier transform is much better suited for lower energy spectroscopies so vibrational spectroscopy microwave spectroscopy um, NMR is basically using radio waves right so any low energy form of spectroscopy you want Fourier transform because your Delta Lambda is already going to be really really tiny for um, vibrations or rotations, right? On the other hand, in dispersion spectroscopy, where you're doing UV vis, um, or even X-ray dispersion spectroscopy, the delta lambdas are already really big just from the transitions themselves, right? The energy and electronic transition is very large. Um, so you could use a dispersion spectrometer for Fourier transform, but your grading would have to be enormous based on the size of the wavelength. And that's not very practical, okay? Um, so let's talk about the Michelson interferometer. And this is gonna really get you into the beef of your SPEC-3 project, okay? So this is a very cool uh, device. So this revolutionized spectroscopy. Um, so in the Michelson interferometer, this is complicated, so I'm just gonna walk you through here. Um, so let me zoom in on the actual device itself. Um, so there are um, two principal mirrors in the Michelson interferometer. There's what we call the fixed mirror, and then there's the chopper mirror. Okay, oh, excuse me, three mirrors. There's the fixed mirror, uh, the chopper mirror, and the moving mirror. Okay, so let's draw those. So we've got a fixed mirror right here, okay? We've got a chopper mirror, and um, that's also called a beam splitter. Um, and the way a beam splitter works, when some light is passed through, roughly 50% of the light will make it all the way through, okay? And 50% of the light will be um, sent in the other direction, okay? And so then you have this moving mirror, which I'll note like this. And we note that mirror is free to uh, vibrate. It says that it's vibrating, but um, 
consider that it's just moving back and forth. Okay. And then now we have uh, a sample. So that's indicated by this little like circle. We could even like, you know, draw our cuvette, if you will. Sure, there's our little cuvette. You don't really use a cuvette in IR, but that's fine. Um, and so then you can see there's like some focusing mirrors um, in the back. But, uh, you know, for simplicity's sake, we'll just say the light passes through a sample and then on to the detector. Okay. Um, oh, and then I forgot to mention that, um, right, there's, of course, this uh, light source that I'll draw like this. So that's actually generating the light, okay? And of course, this passes through, as you note, um, this is what gives you all of these different reflections, right? So it can go up here, it can come through the sample, it can come through the beam splitter, etc. okay? So it eventually makes it through the sample and onto the detector, okay? So let's indicate that. Um, moving through this way, let's see, then, um, you know, it can hit here and move through this way and move through this way and bounce back and forth and all around, okay? So now, here's where this is important. And why does that mirror have to move, all right? So if we consider the following, when um, I'll use the same nomenclature that they've got here, F and M. So when F equals M, when those distances are the same and assuming that they're completely in phase and by in phase we mean like if that's one beam and then when so when these beams get recombined right here at the beam splitter and make it onto the detector if they are in phase right then we'll have uh this nice constructive interference if they're out of phase let's see here then we have destructive interference, right? So when F equals M, that corresponds to this point right there. That's maximum interference. And that's what we, uh, we often call the center burst. Um, and notice that's zero on this scale. And that zero means there's zero relative difference between the distances M and F. And so you can see now what happens as M, let's say as M moves this way, okay, um, that could correspond to now going this way on this scale. And when M moves this way, that corresponds to moving this way on this scale. And that's going to create a whole mess of different interferences. And as it turns out, some wavelengths will be interfered with and just completely annihilated, you no longer have that wavelength making it through the sample. Um, some wavelengths, on the other hand, will be uh, amplified, right? You'll have a, a much stronger intensity of that wavelength, and it makes it through the sample. And what happens, because this mirror is moving at very high precision, extremely high precision, that means if your lamp source is broad and consider that your lamp source is a hot piece of metal and the and a IR spectrometer all it is is a piece of metal that's glowing red hot so it's emitting all of the wavelengths so if I looked at just the spectrum of that lamp just the light intensity versus lambda it's gonna have a black body spectrum so it's all of the wavelengths um, but based on these interference patterns so this is my interferogram certain wavelengths will appear certain wavelengths will disappear and if that mirror is just constantly vibrating right then all wavelengths coming from this lamp will eventually be shined on the sample and we say that it happens um, simultaneously because when we take a Fourier transform spectra, we're letting that vibrating mirror move um, a lot, okay? So this is now where I'm gonna depart from here and I'm gonna go to um, a different screen. Let's see here. So there you can still see me. And now I'm gonna describe your spec 
three assignment interferograms and the Fourier transform. And so the first thing that I want to do is I'm going to change a few things around here on my um, board. So sorry about that. I'm all over the place. So let's first make this all consistent so I can talk about this here. Um, okay, so instead of saying F or M, I'm going to replace these with, uh, oops, nope, I can still call that F and M. This I'm going to call the distance delta. So that's the distance that that mirror moves around. Okay, And as it turns out, spectral resolution in an FTIR spectrometer is given by 1 over delta. And this is the very origin of the wave number unit, because if delta is one centimeter, right, if that vibrating mirror is moving a whole centimeter, then your resolution is one wave number, which is pretty cool, okay? So now, um, how do you know? So one centimeter is a pretty large distance, and I talked about how that mirror moves with crazy amounts of precision. Well, not shown in this schematic is also a helium neon laser, okay, that also fires, oh, I should have a red pen because the helium neon laser is red. I'm going to have to use blue. So that helium neon laser is also firing along this path through all paths and onto the detector. And the helium neon laser is not used um, for this thing. And so I'm going to call the wavelength, I'm going to use H for the wavelength of the helium neon laser. It's 632.8 nanometers, which is the same as 6.328 times 10 to the negative fifth centimeters. And so you notice here on this scale, where it's saying zero plus one lambda plus two lambda or minus one lambda minus two lambda. That lambda is in reference to the wavelength of the helium neon laser. Okay. So what that means is the, um, the total distance that this thing moves um, can be given by, uh, I'll say lowercase delta, okay, which is K times H, where K is an integer equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So when k is equal to 0, the mirror hasn't moved at all. When k is equal to 1, it's moved by one wavelength. When k is equal to 2, it's moved by two wavelengths, three wavelengths, four wavelengths, all the way until you get, let's say, a full one centimeter. So if you had a one centimeter resolution programmed in your spectrometer, which you can do, you would get a crazy number of data points, all right? So because the way that works now is your number of data points, K, is going to be based off of when the laser moves that full one centimeter. So for example, for a one centimeter resolution, you would divide that by 6.328 times 10 to the negative fifth centimeters and that would give you, uh, let's see here, 1 divided by 6.328 e to the negative fifth. That would give you 15,803 data points. 15,803 data points. Okay? And if your spectrometer was going through a range, so let's say you were looking from 4,000 wave numbers to 4, 100 wave numbers, so that's a typical range, right, on an IR spectrometer, you would have 15,803 data points over this range. And so what that means is, so that's 3,600 wave numbers, 4,000 minus 400, okay? So 3,600 divided by 15,803, so that means you would get a data point every 0.227 a etc cetera, etc cetera, wave number so let's back up and talk about what what i just said all there for a second okay if we have a resolution of one centimeter so that means we're allowing our 
moving mirror to sweep out a full one centimeter. It goes from zero, negative one centimeter, back to zero, positive one centimeter. Okay, so really it's like, we should say sweeping out two centimeters, but right, it's a double-sided interference ring. Okay, and so what that means is that one centimeter will have 15,803 helium neon wavelengths so that's the negative one lambda negative two lambda etc and if you are looking between 4,000 and 400 wave numbers in your spectrum you'll get a data point every 0.23 wave numbers so that's crazy high spectral resolution when you think about it that you can get a data point every point two wave numbers you can't do that in a dispersion spectrometer okay so now i'm going to shift over here um, and just highlight a few things. Um, okay, so that's what this diagram is talking about. So here it gives you that equation that I just talked about, delta equals k times h. Um, I'm not going to describe this whole document. I think you should read through it. I spent a lot of time writing it, so you should read through it. But what I do want to show you is it, what we can do in this is create our, our own interfering frequencies. So, for example, suppose that we only allow um, 1,500 wave number radiation through. So that would be like on my um, picture right here. Suppose my lamp is only giving me 1,500 wave number, okay? And it's exactly 1,500 wave number. Then here's my wavelength for that 1,500 wave number. There's my wave. And I would have no interferogram. I would have no interference because it's only one wavelength. But now suppose I have 1,500 and 3,000. So I have the possibility of two interfering wavelengths. And in this exercise, you're going to change the intensity. So you notice the 3,000 has smaller intensity. Um, that's just because I'm having you do it that way. Um, hopefully what you notice is the wavelength of the 3,000 wave number is smaller than the wavelength of the 1,500 wave number as it is supposed to be. And so now if we had those two frequencies they would interfere with each other so here's the interference pattern right so you can see regions where there's positive constructive interference and you can see regions where there's negative destructive interference and of course if we had three wavelengths 1500 3000 and 1000 um, we'd get a more chaotic interference pattern and you notice here on our um, on this scale right here if we allowed if we looked at the interferogram over the whole range of our three frequencies, um, this is what, uh, oh, where did it go? I lost it. Oh, here it is. So then this is, this would be like w the one-sided interferogram. So I'm just showing you only like the positive half. So this nice cartoon here is really like idealized, you know, it's showing you these nice smooth um, interference patterns that's just not reality right so this is what like even with just three frequencies this is what your interference pattern would look like out to like you know what I've called the maximum distance here and in this case uh, the maximum distance you're using was 0.0625 uh, wave number for Delta and all this is described in the in the packet so now, if we were to take a Fourier transform, so we haven't even gotten to the Fourier transform. If we were to compute a Fourier transform, which is a mathematical operation, on this interferogram, this becomes really cool. This is what you get, okay? So you get a peak for your 3,000 wave number, you get a peak for your 1,500 wave number, and you get a peak for your 1,000 wave number. So again, right, the detector would see this, this interference pattern that I'm showing you, the interferogram of all frequencies. That's what the detector would show you, which you would not be able to get a spectrum out of that, right? You would have no idea what you're even looking at. But now you compute the Fourier transform of this, and then this is what you would get. You'd say, oh, I've got 3,000, 1,500, and 1,000 wave number um, absorbances, for example, in my spectrum. And so now what you're going to do, you're going to use your HCL, DCL data to play around with this idea of resolution. I'm not going to give the, I'm not going to spoil it, but you can see what you've got here. Um, if you have a four centimeter resolution, and so again, remember that resolution is one over delta. 
So let's go back to that for a second. I'm here on my board, right? Um, so if my resolution equals four wave numbers, then that means my delta, my maximum, what we call retardation, would have had to been 0.25 centimeters. So we're only allowing it to move 0.25 centimeters. And if I have a resolution equal to a 16 wave number, then my delta would have had to been 0.0625 wave number. So uh, 1 divided by 16 is 0.0625. Okay? And so this would have been the result. So if we use the 16 wave number resolution, you can see um, the peaks aren't as resolved. So I know it's a bigger number and it's backwards in IR because it's one over that distance. So the 16 wave number resolution, you just wouldn't have enough spacing and data points to see the Q branch and the R, or excuse me, the R branch and the P branch very well. But if you use four wave number resolution, which is what was done in the actual experiment, then you can see those peaks are resolved uh, really nicely. And I'm going to show just a couple more data sets here. So here's that HCL DCL data set that you were playing with. Okay. And here, um, you haven't played with this data set, but this is some data that students recorded in PCAM lab. Uh, this is carbon monoxide, um, which is, uh, you can see the B values are much, much closer together. And so what I want to point out, I'm going to grab this table of data here. So here are the wave numbers that was recorded um, for the CO, and that was done at a two wave number resolution, which means delta was 0.5 centimeters. And this HCL was recorded um, at a four wave number resolution, which means delta was 0.25 centimeter. And I just want you to note the difference between the spacing, right? 400.659, 401.1, 401.6, and then here it goes 400, you know, 0 0.2, 401.2, 402.1, right? So to get these types of spectra, you really do need an extremely high resolving power, um, which is only possible doing the Fourier transform. And when you're doing NMR spectroscopy, the need for a Fourier transform and thousands upon thousands of data points is really critical because now you're talking about trying to separate um, basically radio waves. Um, so you have to have a crazy number of data points and resolving power to do that. And so that's why you have to have the Michelson interferometer uh, Fourier transform. Okay. I'll also, uh, I think that I'm actually going to, um, in this video, I think I actually have to put this into two videos because I just realized I've been talking like a really long time. Um, so the last thing I'll say about this, and then I'll, I'll stop this video and, and we'll have a second one. Um, the, maybe you read about the facility at LIGO that detects gravity waves. So it is a Michelson interferometer. However, because gravity waves are like kilometers in length, the Michelson interferometer at the LIGO facility is miles and miles and miles long. So like this F distance and M distance at that LIGO facility are like literally miles. And so the, the vibrating mirror, so the delta value for that vibrating mirror is also on the order of miles. So that's crazy when you think about it. You've got this mirror that's sweeping out like crazy amounts of distances um, and computing a Fourier transform on these enormous waves. Um, and of course, that's why it took us hundreds of years to to get to this. Maybe not hundreds, but decades. Um, but now that facility is is routinely detecting gravity waves, um, which is really cool. And it's all from a Michelson interferometer. Um, okay, so that's a pretty good place to stop for this video. So I'll have a part two uh, where we'll pick up and do the rest of these slides. Okay, folks. Hasta luego.